Hello, this is Mr. Papart, and these are the notes over Chapter 9, The Renaissance, General Characteristics. Let's begin. We're going to review a little bit first. Remember that we finished our unit on the Middle Ages, and the Middle Ages, or the Medieval period, began with the fall of the Roman Empire. Remember that many of the advances made by ancient Greek and Roman civilization were lost during the Medieval period, and... It was also called the Dark Ages because so much knowledge and information was lost. It was a very difficult time. The word Renaissance sometimes is defined as rebirth. And it was a time of coming out of the dark. It was a rebirth of education, science, art, literature, music, and just a better life in general for individuals that lived during that time period. Now, the Renaissance is also sometimes known as the Age of Humanism. Notice the years for the Middle Ages, the year 1450 to 1600. And it was a time of optimism and self-confidence. And curiosity in that time period led people to want to explore. They wanted to explore the world. They wanted to explore knowledge. Uh, they questioned things. They would dissect cadavers, which were human bodies. Um, they were really just curious. There was growing secularization. Remember we talked about the word secular, that means non-religious? Well, secularization means a trend toward being more non-religious. That happened during this time period. Uh, and there were other people other than the church that supported the arts. Uh, also, people at this time period were interested in art just for art's sake. They wanted to enjoy art just because it was beautiful. It didn't have to be religious or have some kind of particular meaning. It was simply just art for art's sake. The New York City of that time period was Florence, Italy. It was a great business and cultural center. And there were merchants and bankers in that city and it was basically the beginning of what we now call the rise of the middle class. Uh, another important event that happened in this time period was the invention of the printing press by Gutenberg in 1440. Uh, let's take just a little diversion here. And we're going to search for a picture of the printing press. Uh, the printing press was so significant because it enabled the dispensation of knowledge. In other words, before the printing press was invented, books were copied by hand. And here's some uh, just some sketches of some printing presses or uh, different pictures, but. Before the printing press was invented, books had to be copied by hand. Music had to be copied by hand. But then, with the invention of the printing press, books, brochures, could be printed quickly and easily. And it could, those information, a piece of information, whether books or brochures, music, whatever, could be spread throughout civilization at that time period. So that was really significant that the printing press was invented. And of course, this affected music, as I mentioned. Of course, this was also a time of discovery of new lands with the growing increase in exp exploration of the world. Now, there was a major event that happened in the Renaissance period. It's called the Protestant Reformation. Notice when you have the word Protestant, notice the first few letters, the word protest. And notice the first few letters of the word Reformation, reform. The Protestant ha Reformation had to do with an individual that was protesting something that happened, and he wanted reform to take place. Now remember that reform means change. Reform means to make a change, to make a change in the way you think, the way you act, uh, the way you look at life. And in this case, it had to do with the way a person looked at religion. 
And this individual was actually named Martin Luther. And Martin Luther was a Catholic monk that lived in Germany during the Renaissance period. He was very devout, which means he was very devoted to his religion. He was very conscious of how sinful he was. He was very conscious of uh, following all the rules of the Catholic Church. And he was also very intelligent. He was educated in Greek and Hebrew. And he studied the Bible in a, with a significant amount of detail um, because the Bible was written in Hebrew and in Greek. And he would read the Bible in these original languages. And one time he was reading uh, his New Testament in Greek and he read a verse that says, the just, which means the godly or holy man, will live by faith. And that one verse really changed the way Martin Luther looked at God, looked at religion. And um, he also looked at some things happening in the Catholic Church that really concerned him. Uh, for example, the Catholic Church would sell things called indulgences. Basically, the bottom line is a person could pay money to have their sins forgiven. And this really bothered Martin Luther because he thought it was wrong. And Martin Luther, because of what he learned about the Bible, the things he saw in the church, it led him to make a list of 95 concerns or complaints about the Catholic Church. And again, notice the root word of Reformation. Martin Luther wanted to reform the church. He wanted to help make it better. And when he listed these 95 complaints about the church, his goal was to make it, in his mind, to become a better church. And what he did is he took these 95 complaints he had written down and he nailed them to the church door. Well, basically, uh, the word got around about what Martin Luther had done. And because of the printing press, people copied these 95 theses and spread them all over Germany in just a matter of, of, of days, probably like a matter of three weeks. And this led to the birth of what we call the Protestant Church, or the non-Catholic Church. And that's why this time was called the Protestant Reformation. It was a protest by Martin Luther trying to lead the reform of the Catholic Church, but it also basically ultimately led to the birth of a new church called the Protestant Church. And uh, every year when we talk about Martin Luther, I always make a point to point out to students that Martin Luther and Martin Luther King are two different people. Let's look at that. Uh, the gentleman here on your right that's Martin Luther from 1517. He was the one that was the, the Catholic monk that led the Protestant Reformation. The one on your left is a gentleman you're probably more familiar with, Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Sr., Martin Luther King's father, actually went to Germany sometime in the 1930s, and he learned a lot about Martin Luther. He was so impressed by what he learned that he changed his name to Martin Luther King Sr. And he changed his son's name to Martin Luther King Jr. So Martin Luther King is actually named after Martin Luther. So but just realize in this chapter we're talking about Martin Luther. Now let's go back to our PowerPoint. Now, uh, Martin Luther also, uh, as a part of the Protestant Reformation, he created a kind of music called a chorale. A chorale is basically a, a church song for worship. It has verses that repeat the music. The music actually repeats, but the verses actually, the words, the lyrics to each verse are different. So the music repeats. And that's what a chorale is. And so that was something that affected music um, 
That's the way music was changed as a result of the Protestant Reformation. Now, something else that happened in this time period uh, was the birth of another church. Uh, it's called the Church of England. The Church of England was started by Henry VIII, but the reason it started was because Henry VIII wanted the Pope to grant him a divorce so he could marry another woman, and the Pope refused. So basically, King Henry VIII of England said, okay, we're going to start our own church in England, and I'm going to be the head of it. Even to this day, the king or queen of England is still the formal head of the Church of England. That means the current head of the Church of England is Queen Elizabeth II. So, we had two major religious events happen during this time period. The Protestant Reformation led by Martin Luther, and then Henry VIII starting the Church of England. In France, the Huguenots uh, existed during this time period. And something else that happened in this time period was called the Counter-Reformation. Uh, the Counter-Reformation was the Catholic Church's response to Martin Luther's complaints. And notice what year it started. It led to the Council of Trent, and it lasted a long time, from 1545 to 1563. That is one long council. They met over a period of, what, about 18 years to, to bring changes to the Catholic Church. And this was the Catholic Church's response to the concerns that Martin Luther raised in the Protestant Reformation. And please understand, this is all foundational to music history because all of these events affected music. Let's talk a little bit about artistic style. In the Renaissance period, they had better quality paint. They also worked more on creating what we call linear perspective. Linear perspective is simply a sense of depth. If you look at this picture, you can see how it looks like these caves in the back or these uh, passageways in the back are further away from where this family is sitting having a meal. And that's called linear perspective. That just means there's a sense of depth or distance in the painting. Um, also, uh, there was a renewed interest in what we call classical antiquity. And classical antiquity refers back to ancient Greece, the history, literature, life, etc. of ancient Greece. And this is an example of interest in ancient uh, Greek culture. This is a painting called The School of Athens by Raphael. And you can see again what we talk about the linear perspective. I'm going to come a little closer here. And you can see how it looks like there's a sense of depth in this painting. And of course, Athens is in Greece. And that's why this is related to ancient Greek culture, the, the School of Athens by Raphael. Um architecture in this time period. Uh, this is an example of architecture. That again, it was an interest in classical antiquity. Uh, you can see that this building, built during this time period, uh, is similar to ruins you would see of ancient Greece or even Rome. Uh, we're going to go, I'm going to find a picture from Athens to show you. And you'll be able to see how uh, the architecture we just looked at was similar to ancient Greek. Look at these pictures of ruins from uh, from Athens. The use of the columns. Um, you can see all these pictures of ruins from Athens, and this is from ancient Greece. So you can see how this building built in the Renaissance was really based on ancient Greek architecture. Music. Now, basically, uh, in music, there were several things happening. Let's start with the Italian city-states. A city-state is basically 
a city that is almost like an independent country. That's what a city-state is. And city-states in this time period had their own composers. And it was really important to these city-states that part of their culture, which means part of their fine arts, was that they had composers in their own city. Music in this time period. And we're going to get into more of this in future chapters. But first of all, the timbre. Remember what timbre means? Timbre means the type or of sounds that you hear. Well, the timbre from this time period was a cappella music. Remember, a cappella means no instruments. And, of course, that means it was only vocal music. The texture was polyphonic. Now, remember we talked about three kinds of textures. Monophonic means one sound or one melody at a time. Polyphonic, poly means many. Polyphonic texture is two or more melodies or sounds playing at the same time. They're independent melodies, but they sound really good together. Uh, the other kind of texture is homophonic texture, where you would have chords playing with the melody on, going on top of it. Well, the Renaissance is known as the Golden Age of Polyphony. And there were also the use of Renaissance modes in this time period. Uh, remember we talked about the modes in the previous chapter, how they were types of scales that really had unique sounds. Well, that concludes our lecture on the general characteristics of the Renaissance. Please contact me on Remind or send me an email if you have any questions. Thank you, students.